Welcome to the London Luminaries, 12 historic organisations working collaboratively to celebrate our collective history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'm your host for this evening. So it's with great delight that I get the opportunity to welcome our fantastic chair this evening. She is a professor in literature and also a trustee of Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust and an eminent broadcaster. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Chris, and all the others who've made this series possible. And welcome to the penultimate in this series of the London Luminaries Talks. Our theme this series has been poets, patrons, politicians, and painters. The series has been going, we think, really well. We've had a wonderful audience engagement, and we're, we're very pleased that we can connect with you online in this way when I know some of you are still finding it difficult to visit our lovely properties but I do encourage you as soon as you can to come to southwest London and see all of our beautiful sites and meet our lovely volunteers and guides. Our talk tonight is about one of the most luminous of our luminaries the painter JMW Turner and the talk is about the sister arts poetry and painting and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, who is Catherine Parry Wingfield, an art historian with a special interest in Turner and in his house, Sandicum Lodge at Twickenham. Recently, she's been thinking a lot about Turner's desire to write poetry, both in the manner of the poets of past generations and in his own voice. This might be a way for us now to learn a little about um, this painter whose deep feelings can be pretty elusive. It might also suggest that Turner aimed to be a polymath like Michelangelo or Leonardo, excellent at many different things. Turner was nothing if not competitive. And over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Judith, uh, and welcome to everyone who has uh, tuned in this evening. And also, I think, Judith, thank you for really flagging up Turner as quite a star in the firmament. Uh, I'm going to go now to my, my first slide and I have put up various lines that link the theme of the sister arts really through the ages. <clears throat> At the very beginning we've got painting and poetry flowing from the same fount, improve, heighten and reflect each other's beauties like mirrors. This is Turner himself in a lecture to the Royal Academy as Professor of Perspective in about 1812, when he was in his mid-30s. And in the background, you'll see uh, William Havel's drawing of Sandicombe Lodge, that little retreat that Turner himself had designed. So here we have Turner, the architect, um, uh, and that's our background. Sandicombe Lodge, if you don't know it, is on the Twickenham side of Richmond Bridge, close to the river, but not quite on it. And then looking at the screen, you'll see that Turner was actually paraphrasing Mark Akenside's poem, The Pleasures of the Imagination, in the mid 18th century. If we go back even further to the fifth century BC, poetry is a speaking picture, painting silent poetry. You can see that this interplay of poetry and painting had been around for a very long time. Of course, we think of Turner primarily as a great painter. The Thames landscape around him when he was in that little house at Sandicombe Lodge and earlier when he rented properties at Isleworth and at Hammersmith. Is, the Thames landscape is hugely inspirational. There are many beautiful paintings but I think also this evening, what we want to think about is the way that the poets of earlier ages walked with him, with their words really ringing in his head. And I think Turner is very competitive. The artists of earlier ages challenged him to try and emulate them. And I think he wanted to write his own poetry in a form of competition, as well as understanding if I was going to do this subject any real justice, I would need to go back to the poets of antiquity, to the Renaissance um, 
artists, uh, poets like Boccaccio, to Shakespeare, to Milton, from his own time, Walter Scott, Byron, and of course not forget the Bible. But obviously in this short time, I can't do that. So we're limiting this short talk to a dip into the ancient world, to the 18th century local poets for us, and to Byron in Turner's own time, and not forgetting Turner himself. Well, this first image, I do apologize. I promise it will get more colorful. This is pretty minimal, and you may be wondering why on earth I have put up what looks like a rain spattered page from one of Turner's well-filled sketchbooks uh, from about 1805, when at the age of 30 or so, he's renting a house right on the Thames at Isleworth. When Turner rented that, um, that property, he took with him quite a number of books, and that probably included at least some of the 13 volumes of the extremely useful publication, The Works of the British Poets. And this included Alexander Pope's translation of Homer's Iliad um, and Odyssey, and Dryden's translation uh, of Virgil. So um, very handy. Turner, as I'm sure you all know, was the son of a Covent Garden barber and his formal education really was quite minimal. Here, he's just sketching out a first idea. Perhaps you can make out the prow of a rather exotic ship, sails furled here. Perhaps another one just emerging there, another ship. Uh, just one continuous line indicating a crouching figure. And perhaps the most uh, interesting bit of all is down here, Turner has written Ulysses and Polly. Well, those early ideas, um, Ulysses was the Latinized form of Odysseus, which Pope had used. And Turner is going to study Pope's words very, very closely. And so I'm giving you now, moving to a bit of color. In fact, a wonderful pop of color here. Um, and this is the painting that many, many years later would emerge from those early minimal sketches, Ulysses deriding Polyphemus of 1829 this magnificent oil. This is an absolutely incandescent painting. At this moment, Ulysses has returned from the Greeks' victory over the Trojans. He's been shipwrecked. He and his companions took refuge in a cave, which unfortunately for them was the lair of Polyphemus, the terrifying one-eyed giant. Polyphemus had devoured some of Ulysses' companions for his supper. And this is where Ulysses' famed cunning comes to his rescue, because he will blind Polyphemus with a brand from a fire in the giant's cave. You can see it blazing away here. And he will then instruct his companions, those that hadn't been eaten, to cling to the bellies of Polyphemus's sheep so that when the giant releases the, the sheep from the cave, he can't see them anymore. He just feels the top of the sheep and the, the Ulysses companions are clinging on to the fleeces underneath. Even better, they not only make their escape back to the ship, but they also steal their captor's flock into the bargain. In Alexander Pope's words, they sail when rosy morning glimmered o'er the dales. Here we've got a magnificent sunrise, really turning the sea to liquid gold. And Ulysses, a tiny figure up here, screaming, hurling abuse at the giant up here, just a shadowy figure up at the top of the cliff. And you can see his words, on the screen, hear me, O Cyclop, hear, ungracious host, t'was on no coward, no ignoble slave, thou meditatest thy meal in yonder cave, but one, the vengeance fated from above, doomed to inflict the instrument of Jove, 
thy barbarous breach of hospitable bands, the god, the god, revenge is by my hands. So the, the giant will hurl a great boulder into the sea, and that will drive the ship back to shore. But Neptune hears Ulysses and calms the sea, and so they make their escape. But Ulysses hasn't done with hurling abuse. Uh, Polyphemus, you can see the detail here. He's still brandishing uh, the fire, the flame with which he's put out Polyphemus's solitary eye. Um, but we've got more derision. Here he says, Cyclop, if any pitying thy disgrace, ask who disfigured thus that eyeless face. Say it was Ulysses, with his deed declare, Laertes' son of Ithaca the fair. Ulysses, far in fighting fields renowned, before whose arm Troy tumbled to the ground. Wonderfully aggressive and defiant painting. And I think it's a very noisy painting. If you could turn up the sound, you'd hear the clashing rocks in the background, the creaking oars, the roaring sea. The, 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 the uh, companions of Ulysses all here up in the rigging, joining in the insults being hurled at the giant and the giant, no doubt, bellowing in pain and rage. The classics will also inform other works uh, from that time of peaceful solitude in Isleworth. And we go now, still a sunrise, but to the sketchbooks again and to um, a, a, a very small but exquisite watercolour contained within those sketchbooks that Turner always carried with him. So from that totally minimal sketch that we had of, of Ulysses and Polyphemus, we now have something that really encapsulates so many of Turner's ideas. And the subject now is going to be from Dryden's translation of Virgil's Aeneid, another classical theme, but one that's going to engage Turner for many years. And this is the ultimately tragic love story of Dido, Queen of Carthage, and Aeneas, the Trojan prince, shipwrecked on the shore of Carthage, fleeing from defeat by the Greeks, including, of course, Ulysses. Turner gathered together observations of the Thames and Richmond Hill, particularly, to conjure up ancient Carthage, when finally this work, nearly a decade later, appears as a magnificent oil, his friends always said, well, Carthage is really Richmond Hill, you know. So this is the early part of this great romance, uh, just the beginning. We have a sunrise again, and in, in Dryden's translation, we have when next the sun his rising light displays and gilds the world below with purple rays. You see Turner, ever the painter, is giving us this soft purple hues beginning to light up these magnificent imagined buildings of ancient Carthage. I'm afraid we don't really have buildings like that on the Twickenham bank uh, of the Thames. The Queen Aeneas and the Tyrian court shall to the shady woods for Sylvan Games resort. And this is the painting which emerged nearly 10 years later, Dido and Aeneas. And this subject matter will occupy Turner, many other magnificent paintings. I'm sure many of you will know Dido building Carthage in, in the National Gallery, where it accompanies some paintings by Claude, who of course is Turner's great historic mentor, you might say. So, moving at speed as we must through the centuries. I've actually covered my watch up, but I know I've got to keep an eye on it. Um, into the 18th century and to the poets, uh, we rather grandly call them our local poets. 18th century Twickenham to begin and then to Richmond. Here, Alexander Pope, and I put on the screen 
the engraving after Turner's great watercolour of Pope's villa at Twickenham during its dilapidation. The oil painting, the oil painting itself, I'm afraid, left this country well over a decade ago and is now in the States. But this, of course, you can see at Turner's house when it reopens. By this time, Turner is spending a great deal of time writing his own poetry, but he's particularly inspired partly by Alexander Pope and even more perhaps by James Thompson, who we'll consider in a moment. Exploring the Twickenham and Richmond Riverside would, would have made him acutely aware of the fate of the villa of Alexander Pope on Cross Deep in Twickenham. In 1807, it became the property of Baroness Howe, later to be known as the Queen of the Goths for her act of terrible destruction. She objected to the fact that riverborne tourist celebrity, it, I don't know what you would call them, but the trade, people floating by and peering through her windows with people no doubt it's telling them as I do here, all about the fame of the long dead poet. She decided to pull the villa down and build another house further away. It looks like an elegiac picture, but in fact, when you look at the building, you can see it is roofless. You can see the scaffolding as in Turner's own words, uh, the rude hammer, the rude hammer of destruction is about to knock it completely to the ground. In Turner's words, this is glimmering evening, the sun still lighting the cloud. And in our foreground, you can see our shepherds, our rustic figures really wondering what all this is about. One of them holding uh, a canvas, maybe salvaged from that house. Um, and there's a Corinthian capital down there somewhere, part of the, the demolition. Otherwise it's, a beautiful elegiac summer evening. When Turner wrote his own verses, and these would accompany that painting as Dryden's words had accompanied Dido and Aeneas when it was exhibited at the Royal Academy. Here, Turner's exhibiting in his own gallery in Harley Street up in, up in London. And it's his own poetry that appears with it so we have him, you can see uh, the, the words up on the screen. Sister Isis, tis thy Thames that calls, see desolation hovers o'er those walls, scattered timbers on the margin lays, where glimmering evening yet lingering plays. And later on, now to destruction, do dooms thy peaceful grot, Pope's willow bending to the earth forgot, save one week Zion by my fostering care, nursed into life. At the beginning, it's the Thames that's speaking. The Thames is the, if you like, the narrator of this poetry. But then that shifts to Turner himself because the tree that the, the ancient wreck of a tree that you see here is not that willow. The Pope's willow said to be the first of the weeping willows that to be grown in England that had blown down in a storm and Turner had taken a cutting from it, obviously a good gardener, carried it back uh, to his own plot of land as yet unbuilt on, uh, planted it there where it thrived. Well, leaving, leaving Turner now for James Thompson, a slightly younger poet, uh, and perhaps actually just before we leave um, Baroness Howe and Turner, I should say that in his sketchbooks, he scratched some utterly scurrilous poetry, a kind of savage and, and um, really vengeful uh, revenge, personal revenge on Baroness Howe. He cast her as Dido, but not Dido, the queen newly in love with Aeneas, but Dido has become lustful. So Baroness Howe and her lover become uh, um, Dido and Aeneas and that famous grotto becomes the place where they 
as it were, enjoy their lust. You can get some idea of that anger. Again, you can come to Turner's house when it reopens next week. You can look at the facsimile sketchbooks and you can try and work out what it is that Turner is saying. So moving, as I said, to this slightly younger contemporary of Alexander Pope, the Scot James Thompson, who settled in Richmond, Thompson's poetry would be a huge inspiration and in his own time, uh, in Thompson's own time, enduring well into the 19th century, his fame was for this great poem, The Seasons. Thompson, like Turner, loved that wide expansive view of the Thames that you get from the top of Richmond Hill. And Summer from the Seasons is, is a, a long poem that filled Turner's mind as he worked on a number of paintings. And this painting, Thompson's Aeolian Harp, this is, this is really Turner's homage to James Thompson and his poetry. This is not recording the view from Richmond Hill, but evoking it and turning it really into another worldly Arcadia. They hang up here, the, the nymphs or the muses are hanging up an Aeolian harp. And this is a reference to Thompson's own poem, uh, an ode uh, to Ode on Aeolus's harp. And that is what gives the painting its name. That harp is played by the winds. It needs no human hand. Aeolus is the god of the winds who can pluck the strings and bring forward beautiful music. I don't know if anyone else was listening to Radio 3 at about quarter past seven this morning, but there was a wonderful modernist piece of piano music called the Aeolian Harp. Absolutely beautiful. You might catch it um, on, on, um, on BBC Sounds if you didn't hear it. It was, it was a wonderful piece and linking interestingly for this talk, um, to James Joyce's Ulysses. Things do somehow have a way of emerging, don't they? So Thompson is celebrated by this, this tomb that we see here with more figures gathering round. Thompson's real tomb is not up on Richmond's Hill. Thompson is buried in the church of St Mary Magdalene in Richmond. And Alexander Pope comes into it. Alexander Pope, who had been um, really lauded by James Thompson, and uh, he becomes Alexis the poet, in fact, Pope's own shepherd with his flock. And the Thames, in, in Pope's words, is the Silver Thames, where dancing sunbeams on the water played. So once again, we've got the sky, the sun, the sunbeams and the water, all of these which had been drawn out in the poetry of the 18th century and Turner thinking about that. And when he exhibited this, he provided 32 lines of his own poetry, referring back to James Thompson's seasons and having such a struggle to find the right words, he reworks them over and over again. I'll just give you four. On Thompson's tomb, the dewy drops distill soft tears for Pope's lost fame. To worth and verse adhere sad memory still, scorning to wear ensnaring fashion's chain. And he finishes with a reference to Thompson's hallowed shrine, that imaginary, that allegorical tomb. I find this one of Turner's most beautiful and magical and really mysterious paintings, but it also one with that poetry of Turner's that makes me ask a question, perhaps for you, the audience. Why did Turner seem to spend so much time filling a verse book, 75 pages of it, scribbling away into his sketchbooks and also writing other poetry on, uh, on quite specific themes. What, what was he doing? Was he trying to find a depth of meaning and his own way of expressing it? I'll be interested to know what you think.
I'm going to move now from the wonderful tranquility of that painting to something which is far more extraordinary. So no longer a summer evening, but midwinter, the opposite end of a range of weather and of emotions. We go to the ferocity of winter storms, alpine storms, and also to the ferocity of vicious warfare and disillusion. Snowstorm Hannibal crossing the Alps. This here, Turner, is conjuring up ancient imperial ambition. Hannibal the Carthaginian seeking to invade Italy, crossing the Alps in the bleakest of weather where there was much bloodshed. It's really nature that dominates here, two thirds, more than two thirds, I think, of the canvas, really taken up with this terrifying vortex of a storm and this sickly sun struggling and not succeeding really to give any light to this bleak scene. In fact, nature is so terrifying, it really detracts almost from this rather horrifying bludgeoning that's going on in the foreground. And it completely dwarfs the figure of the famous elephants that Hannibal used to take uh, his baggage train across the Alps. Turner wrote a series of poems, which he called Fallacies of Hope. And when he exhibited this at the Royal Academy, in the catalogue, he added his own unpublished fragmentary verses on the themes of rise of empire and indeed their fall, craft, treachery, fraud, looked on the sun with hope, low, broad and worn, the fierce archer of the downward year stains Italy's blanched barrier with storms, in vain each pass, in sanguined, deep with blood, with, sorry, with dead, but it's the same thing, isn't it? We've had in sanguined, blood comes up over and over again. Turner had imagined Hannibal in a high place. The Carthaginian stood and marked with eagle eye his victim, Rome. Carthage would rise and it would fall. Rome would do the same. And undoubtedly, the great crowds that flocked to the Academy exhibition to see this painting would not have missed the ambitions of a contemporary emperor, Napoleon, who a few years before had also taken invading forces across the Alps into Italy. The long wars with France were still continuing in 1812, and that crowd would have been only too aware that they were not out of, out of fear yet. I think Turner was using some of James Thompson's poetry again, this time winter from the seasons and turning Thompson's words around in his mind and coming up in some ways with very similar lines of his own. But nevertheless, I think you can see the depth of feeling that we have here and perhaps in that, that series of short poems, Fallacies of Hope, the most telling of all, uh, I haven't put the, the image up on, on the screen, but you will all know that painting of 1840, the slavers with throwing overboard the dead and dying, and Turner's telling words there, hope, hope, fallacious hope, where is thy market now? It could hardly be more hitting, could it? Well, I'm going to leave that behind and move on, maybe not cheerfully, but to modern life, or should I indeed perhaps say modern death? I'm not quite sure how I should introduce it. This is, I think, a terrifying painting. This is 1818, The Field of Waterloo. Modern poetry now is in Turner's mind and it underlies his ideas and his emotions. This is not his own words, but Byron's Child Harold, Byron's great epic where he takes his 
young, rather disillusioned, rather feckless youth on wanderings through Europe. First of all, in fact, he takes him into fair Italy and Turner would treat that rather happier subject later on. But here it's the field of Waterloo, the dreadful field, the dreadful battlefield, at last the final battle. Byron in his poetry had conjured up the famous ball that took place on the eve of battle in June 1815, with everyone fired up with the hope of victory and glory. And there was victory, but when Byron's Harold comes to look at the field of Waterloo, in his words, in Byron's word, he stands upon this place of skulls, the grave of France, the deadly Waterloo. Turner would go there himself two years later, but these vividly imagined horrors, distraught women come to seek for their bodies of their lovers, their husbands, their sons, maybe one woman fainting, uh, another carrying a little child, carrying torches in order to see this terrible scene of carnage, burning farmhouse in the background, flares going up. It is truly a terrible scene. And I think Turner painting very emotionally about the fact that there is really no glory, just thousands of deaths and the grave of imperial ambition. Well, Turner was born a Georgian. He died a Victorian, of course. Uh, I do know that in the theater, the Georgians hated a sad ending to a play. And I think perhaps he probably would hate a sad ending to a talk. So I'm moving here um, to something which perhaps brings us back to where we might hope to be before too many months go by. And this is England, Richmond Hill on the Prince Regent's birthday, 1819, those long Napoleonic wars now over. It's summertime, it's a wonderful day, and there's a party. What more could you possibly ask for? Turner hoping to catch the eye of the Prince Regent, hoping that the Prince Regent would buy this enormous painting. It's about three meters wide. But here we are, this is modern life. Richmond Hill is not ancient Ar Arcadia. It's not full of allegorical tombs or anything like that. There are no classical buildings perched on the Twickenham bank. Just a hugely fashionable crowd waiting to greet the prince on his real birthday, which came in summertime rather than his official birthday, which was on April the 23rd, St George's Day. And to accompany this painting shown at the Royal Academy, Turner decided to return to James Thompson and to summer. Say, shall we wind along the streams or walk the smiling mead or court the forest glades or wander wild among the wa waving harvests or ascend while radiant summer opens all its pride, thy hill delightful sheen. Those lines of Thompson's hung from a tree up at the top of Richmond Hill in Turner's day. And now if you go into Richmond Park from that entrance up on Richmond Hill, a little way in, you'll find that delightful poet's corner and you'll find those words again. I think this theme that nature living in harmony with its rhythms or possibly as we've seen at the mercy of what it can inflict, that's run through much of the poetry from classical times through the 18th century to Turner's own poetry. And I know I've only scratched the surface in this short talk, but I do hope that I've opened up perhaps a new aspect of Turner for some of you. If you want to dig deeper, I'm going to, in a moment, hold up a book. You might like to get it. But for the moment, I will move on and conclude by 
asking you whether you might like to think about volunteering at Turner's house, which is small but beautiful. And the team of volunteers are extremely uh, well informed as you can be, should you choose to join us. And I'm sure you would enjoy it very much indeed. And then we can go to the last slide where, of course, I must point out that if you wish to support the work of Turner's House, you could go to Turner's House website and maybe donate. And now I think I'm going to return to Judith. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much for that absolutely amazing talk. Um, I, I knew about the, uh, the poem on Pope, but I didn't know about any of the rest you mentioned a book would you like to hold that up um no. we, yeah so, can you tell us what what the book is am i going to stop sharing no no just hold the book up and we'll, we'll oh, talk okay yeah there we go yeah. uh in Painting fact poetry. this is from a 1990 tate exhibition and it's andrew wilton he in fact got things the right way round from my point of view but not from yours judith painting and poetry not poetry and painting. And uh, all Turner's poetry, some of it extraordinarily difficult to read, was transcribed by Rosalind Turner and all the transcriptions are within this. You will have to get it. I think probably it's out of print. So you will have to get it probably online. Excellent. Thank you so much. I wanted to make sure that everybody had a, a chance to, to see that, that book. I, I also want to, before we open um, the question and answer session, I want to draw everybody's attention to the last talk in this series on Boston, Boston Manor House, which I think is also going to be full of surprises for the people. It's probably the least well known of our luminaries venues. I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. And this is uh, the last of this series. We have all of uh, the, the first half of the season and the previous seasons are all available for you to watch on our YouTube channel.